Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in making his contribution earlier, the Prime Minister mentioned the fact that he is extremely focused and that he will not allow anything to distract him in the discharge of his duties. And in keeping with the, the utterances of the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I am finding it extremely difficult to remain focused on my presentation and not respond to some of what we heard coming out of the other side, in particular the member for Chozel Saltibus. Mr. Speaker, he tried to draw a parallel between employment at Ojo Labs and the initiative that is before the parliament this morning as it relates to skills training for young people in this country. But as I said, Mr. Speaker, this morning, I will allow those comments to go by outside the off-stump, to use a cricket analogy, and focus on what is before me. Mr. Speaker, I want to crave your indulgence to reach out to the substantive holder of the chair, who is unwell on and unable to be with us this morning. I speak of the Honorable Claudius Francis. Mr. Speaker, I wish him a speedy recovery, and it is my sincere hope that sooner than later he will rejoin us in this chamber to do what he does um, best, Mr. Speaker, and that is to provide order and guidance in the Honorable House. So, Mr. Speaker, I wish, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I wish Mr. Speaker a speedy recovery. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the motion presented by the Minister for Finance and the Honorable Prime Minister. And Mr. Speaker, this particular motion is one that is justified and one that can yield untold benefits for the young people of our country. And the motion is to secure monies for the execution of a very necessary project spearheaded by the OECS Commission. And Mr. Speaker, skills, training, and innovation are more necessary in the development of young people today than ever before. But Mr. Speaker, I cannot present on the motion without paying homage to the staff at the OECS Commission, in particular those persons in the Education Management and Development Unit. Mr. Speaker, there is merit in working together as an OECS, as a sub-grouping of islands in the Caribbean space. Mr. Speaker, we have been able to collaborate on a number of areas of national development and areas of programming across the islands. And so we meet very often at the technical level, and we also meet at the ministerial level as what is known as, as, as council. So for somebody like me, Mr. Speaker, in the government of St. Lucia, with portfolio responsibilities for education, sustainable development, innovation, science, technology, and vocational training, I find myself being part of two councils of ministers. COM, C-O-M-E, the Council of Ministers of Education, and I'm also on the other COM, Mr. Speaker, the Council of Ministers of the Environment. And Mr. Speaker, when we meet at the ministerial level, we have an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to deal with common challenges as they manifest themselves across the islands. When we meet as, at an OECS level, Mr. Speaker, we are able to address some of the issues as they relate to economies of scale. Because you know St. Um, Lucia is the largest of the OECS territories demographically with a population of approximately 180,000 people, Mr. Speaker. And sometimes as big as we might be in an OECS context, the numbers are insufficient to cause us to do a lot of things that we perhaps could have done and achieved greater results doing when we, we collaborate as a subgrouping with almost half a million people. Mr. Speaker, it's an opportunity to share best practice. And Mr. Speaker, we learn from each other's um, challenges as an OECS. And there are a number of initiatives that we've been able to collaborate on, particularly in the realm of education. And one such initiative is the rollout of the PEARL, P-E-A-R-L, the Program for Educational Advancement and Relevant Learning, a four-year program supported by GPE, the Global Partnership for Education, where the OECS collectively, we are benefiting from $10 million 
to help improve the education system and sector in the OCS um, on a number of fronts. One such program under the pool, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, is the Pre-K Project. You would have heard me in this parliament before speak to the fact that we have had a significant decline in the enrollment of students at our primary schools. And when the numbers drop, Mr. Speaker, space is being made available at the school whereby we can incorporate what we call pre-K um, um, programs where children from areas that are deprived of early childhood services, um, those children, Mr. Speaker, can find a space at the existing primary school in the community, um, thereby exposing them to the rudiments of education and nurturing them in an environment that, that fosters proper child development. Mr. Speaker, also under the pull, we've been able to harmonize and improve the primary school curriculum for students across the OECS. So I say all this to say that there is merit in collaboration at the level of the OECS. And from a ministerial standpoint in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, I am particularly pleased with the work that has been done by the Commission, and in particular, the education unit at, at, at the Commission. Mr. Speaker, this new project seeks to strengthen skills and employability by improving educational opportunities in high-value added sectors and fostering quality and innovative and innovation, sorry, among OECS national colleges and institutions, or what we call the higher um, or the wider post-secondary space. Mr. Speaker, our education system has one primary focus, and that is to prepare the young people entrusted in our care for life after school, so that they one day will take their rightful places in society. Mr. Speaker, there was a time in the history of this country when we had junior secondary schools. And if you had completed forms one, two, and three at a junior secondary school, you had done sufficient by way of educating yourself to land a job in the government system. And the expectation of every child who was graduating from secondary edu um, a secondary education program was to land a job if with government. Today, in the year 2024, we know that the public service no longer has the absorptive capacity to employ the 2,200 school leavers we have annually. And so, Mr. Speaker, we must begin to think out of the box. We must create avenues and an enabling environment whereby those young persons, they can become employers themselves and they can also become employable, Mr. Speaker, even beyond the shores of our country. Mr. Speaker, our education system is about producing global citizens. So that the child from the Bus Laguas Combined School in the constituency of Labri Oji, or the child from the Olio Combined School in Denry North, or the child from the Fonasso Combined School in Babono, irrespective of where that child is enrolled, Mr. Speaker, the educational experience that we are looking to impact ought to be one that prepares that child to be on the same wavelength as his or her counterpart, whether they happen to be in Singapore, Canada, Ghana, or anywhere else in the world. And you can only do so effectively by having an appreciation for the times in which we live. So Mr. Speaker, it is not enough for a child to graduate from secondary school and just enroll at the South Louis Community College, follow a program, and believe that this child is ready for the world of work. We live in a very dynamic global environment. And professionals have to constantly be retooling. And that is why it has become so necessary for us, Mr. Speaker, almost on a monthly basis, to be looking at ways of improving the curriculum and the opportunities that we give to our young people. Mr. Speaker, we have a huge gap deficit in terms of how we train our people and their readiness to take up some of the jobs that are available in this country. And I'm sure the Minister responsible for Labour, Member of Parliament for Babono, will tell you, Mr. Speaker, that almost on a weekly basis, she is inundated with requests to sign work permits for individuals whom we have to import into this country to do work 
that some of our people have not been adequately trained to do up to a standard that would make it acceptable at the international level. So, Mr. Speaker, this project, this is money well spent. This is money well allocated. And this is a project that receives the full support of the Ministry of Education, not simply by virtue of we being the executing agency um, working collaboratively with the OECS, but we believe there is merit in this. Mr. Speaker, qualifications matter. And it is against that backdrop very early when we assume government as a political party. One of the first memorandum or, or memos to come out of the Ministry of Education was the National Qualifications Framework. Mr. Speaker, today, whether you are pursuing a CVQ program, whether you are, pro you are following a program at the CSEC level, any form of certification or qualification you receive in St. Lucia, that is juxtaposed against some of the best standards established globally. So that when a child leaves St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, and migrates to North America, and you present your CVQ or your NVQ, it speaks to a certain degree of competence that will make you acceptable in that particular environment when you reach there. So, Mr. Speaker, we are fully behind this program. We support this program. The South Louis Community College will benefit immensely from, from monies from that program to broaden the horizon, its horizon in terms of the relevant skills and training that our young people need to function effectively today. The National Skills Development Centre in SDC will also benefit from this program, Mr. Speaker, and it is part and parcel of this comprehensive training program that we have for our young people in secondary school, and in particular, those who are in the post-secondary space. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister spoke of the need for the incorporation of technology. And this is one of the strongest areas of programming for the Ministry of Education today. We have reinstated the One Laptop Per Child program because we believe, Mr. Speaker, that in the year 2024, that every child should have access to a device to help with the learning and teaching um, process. But Mr. Speaker, we also know, and this is a point that I have made before, notwithstanding some of the rhetoric you hear coming from the other side, be it in here or, or, or on, on, on social media. I am on the record, if you just have to peruse Hansard, Mr. Speaker, of saying that it is not enough to give a child a device. And that is why our government, the Prime Minister through the Senior Minister, sat down with the service providers in this country and were able, in the first instance, to secure approximately 5,000 bundle packages to give connectivity and access to internet services to students and families who come from indigent and marginalized communities. Mr. Speaker, connectivity is critical and it is important so that a child can stay in, in, in Bhutto or a child can stay in Marsha or a child can be in Monkey Tong or a child can be in, in Forest Year and he or she notwithstanding the inability of his or her parents to pay an internet bill the government led by the honorable member for Castries East has come forward and said to them here is a bundle that gives you access and you can access the internet and you can access the teaching material in much the same way that your counterpart from other parts of the country can do mr speaker we have gone further we have gone further, Mr. Speaker, and I'm hearing the senior minister saying that in addition to the first 5,000 that I mentioned, he has secured another 4,000, thereby reaching more families. But that is not all we've done with the laptops, Mr. Speaker, to accentuate our appreciation for the incorporation of technology in education and in lesson delivery. Mr. Speaker, we took professionals within the school system, our teachers, we did not pay them any additional monies. We didn't have to pay them license fees. And Mr. Speaker, I need to invite you to the Ministry of Education to see for yourself how they were able to take the subjects that we teach and develop content that they are uploading onto those devices for the children of St. Lucia. That is what we have done, Mr. Speaker. But instead, when we came in, 
When we came in, Mr. Speaker, on the laptop program, you know what we found? The government of St. Lucia was paying millions of dollars to a foreign entity, Mr. Speaker, that had developed software and embedded the software or the subjects onto a very flimsy device. That could not, devices that could not have been repaired by the technical staff of the Ministry of Education. And that money, Mr. Speaker, was being paid, being expatriated, and whoever was happy was happy. Today, Mr. Speaker, today, I invite every one of the parliamentarians in here to come to the ministry. And if you don't have the time to come to the ministry, you can put in a request through me, and I will make the technical team available to you to show you how they were able to develop content that is rele culturally relevant, Mr. Speaker, to our circumstances. And we pay no license fees. Mr. Speaker, you know what we've been able to do with the savings from that? We have increased the number of scholarships that we are giving to St. Lucia's. Mr. Speaker, we all know it when we grew up. In places like Japan and other parts of the world, at the age of 21, 22, children are beginning to entertain thoughts of graduate studies, masters, and even PhD. 10, 15, 20 years ago, the average St. Lucian would have had a bachelor's degree when you were about 25, 26, particularly if you were not from an affluent community where your parents had land and, 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 and materials to use as, as collateral to face the bank. Mr. Speaker, today, and I will say it at every opportunity, in this house and elsewhere, the children of ordinary St. Lucians today who demonstrate that they have the aptitude and the ability they too will be putting on graduation gowns because they would have completed university education. That is what we are about. So Mr. Speaker, when you hear people who cannot come to terms with the fact that they have been rejected by the people and their primary concern is to create disquiet and to try and encourage discord and to not want to give the government a chance to govern, Mr. Speaker, when you hear those things, Mr. what it does, Mr. Speaker, I can speak for myself, it fires me up. It ignites the passion for me to cross the bad lil with even more purpose to take my place on the waterfront to lead the charge in giving a better educational experience to the children of this country. So, Mr. Speaker, this, as I said, is money well allocated. This is not money being borrowed to use against our opponents. Mr. Speaker, we embrace all the young people in this country for our programming. And in everything that we have done as an administration, Mr. Speaker, our policies have always been predicated on equity. Whether it is CDP, Mr. Speaker, when the Prime Minister gets the check from the Taiwanese embassy and he passes it on to the Treasury, he ensures that every single one of the 17 MPs in this House is so empowered that he can execute a project in his constituency. But Mr. Speaker, I remember the experience that I had in opposition. And I sat there, Mr. Speaker, and I watched the PowerPoint presentations on this screen over there. And Mr. Speaker, I wondered when on earth or when in the five years would I be able to dig a drain for a, an affected family in Denrinov. Mr. Speaker, I was denied. And I've said before, Mr. Speaker, when I leave home in the morning to come to Parliament, on the way to this Parliament, no fewer than five hardwares. And I couldn't procure a bag of cement. But your Saksima to do a project. And we were laughed at and ridiculed. But Mr. Speaker, in as much as we denounce that, and I'm happy that the Prime Minister, with his wisdom, has decided, notwithstanding what some of our own supporters think, that he is not going to follow that pattern. And that he can rise above that pettiness because he understands that we are in that for the people. We are putting people first, irrespective of which constituency they're from. We are putting people first, irrespective of which political affiliation their rep um, carries into the parliament. And that is what we are about. And this, Mr. Speaker, this motion, working collaboratively with the OECS and the government of Grenada, we are putting the young people of this country first. Mr. Speaker, I support the motion to borrow the money. 
I support the arrangements to work with the OECS Commission on this. And Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that the benefits to be derived from this can only make for a better cadre of young people who will be taking their rightful places in the public sector, in the private sector, and very importantly, Mr. Speaker, they are being skilled, tooled, and being trained to start their own businesses, to make themselves employable, and they too can become employers of their peers who otherwise would not be in a position to be able to do that for themselves. So, Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I support the motion, and I look forward to working very, very closely with the OECS Commission and the staff of the Ministry of Education for a successful implementation.